So welcome everyone to the eighth installment of NCFS in Captivity, a monthly book discussion series that features newly published books in 19th century studies. The series, as you know, was organized by Rachel Nash from Yeshiva University, Susan McCready from University of Alabama, and myself. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn our attention to uh, today's uh, book. Uh, so we're discussing, today we're discussing Marnie Kessler's new book, which I have right here, uh, Discomfort Food. Uh, the Culinary Imagination in Late 19th Century French mm -hmm. Art. Um, and our plan for today, after I introduce our interlocutors, Marnie Kessler, of course, and Janet Weiser. Uh, first, um, Janet and Marnie will briefly um, introduce the book, uh, and then they will discuss it for about half an hour. And then we will open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, but please feel free to uh, drop your own questions in the chat at any point, and we'll get to them um, toward the end of the session. So I'm delighted to introduce our two interlocutors today. Uh, Janet Beiser has split her career between University of Virginia and Harvard University, where she's currently the C. Douglas Dillon Professor of the Civilization of mm -hmm. France. She has been the beneficiary of fellowships uh, from the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEH, the ACLS, and Humanities Centers at Stanford University, um, as well as the Australian National University and the University of Canterbury at, in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, her book publications include um, Thinking Through the Mothers, Reimagining Women's Biographies, uh, Ventriloquized Bodies, Narratives of Hysteria in 19th Century France, and Family Plots by Zach's Narrative Generations. Janet is finishing a book on the aesthetic uses of the traffic in uh, leftovers in the long 19th century, in the long French 19th century, tentatively called the Harlequin Eaters, Leftovers and the Patchwork Imagination in 19th century France. And I hope we can host the book in NCFS and Captivity or maybe in NCFS uh, Libéré. Uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, Marnie Kessler is professor and, direct, uh, professor and director of graduate studies in the Kress Foundation Department of Art History at the University of Kansas, where she teaches courses on 18th and 19th century European art and critical theory and methodology. She is the author of Sheer Presence, The Veil in Manès, Paris, published in uh, 2007 by the University of Minnesota Press, as well as book chapters and articles uh, on topics related to portraiture, urbanism, photography, food, and fashion in the works of such artists as uh, Manet, Degas, uh, Caillebot, Morisseau, Monet, and Guyard. Her new book, here again, Discomfort Food, the Culinary Imagination in Late 19th Century French Art, explores the deep and unexpected resonances in images of food. And please do yourself a favor and buy it. It is a spectacular book and there is a discount code that will be in the chat. Uh, research for the book was supported by Schlesinger Library and Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the New, uh, the New York Public Library, Hall Center for the Humanities, and the um, Kansas University College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Dean's Research Excellence Fund. Uh, Marnie is currently at work on an article for Disneuf that considers the materiality and medium um, specificity of pastel, pas of pastel, and her essay Berthe Morisseau in Morning will appear in uh, an upcoming volume of Yale Journal French Studies. So welcome, um, Janet and um, Marnie, and I'm going to turn it over to first Janet, correct? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. All right. Yes. I wanted to take the opportunity to say a few words as uh, one of the early readers of Discomfort Food to say some things that um, it's likely Marnie wouldn't say herself, but that really need to be said about this wonderful book. Uh, in Discomfort Food, Marnie Kessler blends richly layered components of art history, cultural studies, and literature, and simmers them in a gorgeous prose. 
Hers is a book that takes risks. And I have in mind here first a certain iconoclastic vision of art historical genres, notably still life. But more broadly, when I talk about taking risks, I'm referring to the melding of the scholarly and the archival, the intellectual and the theoretical with an intensely personal vision and a strikingly original voice. This is the voice of memory and passion and loss. By risk, I'm thinking too about what I see as a, the calculated wager of a seasoned critic and writer. As I was reading Discomfort Food in this time of captivity, I was reminded again and again of what it means even now, especially now, to be human, to be a scholar and a human, to be a human scholar, a scholar of the humanities in the fullest sense. I think it has something to do with unleashing the powers of perception, both sensory and intellectual, and infusing them with emotion and imagination. Discomfort food implicitly prods its readers to consider some critical questions beyond its explicit purview, which Marnie will soon be telling you about. Who are we as individuals when we view a painting or read a poem or listen to a symphony? What happens in the coming together of art and the aesthetic consumer? And what lies in the interstices of art and its engaging of the beholder? What happens in this case, among other things, is Marnie's writing. And before turning the session over to her, I want to give you just the smallest taste of her prose. Here, I'll be quoting from the first chapter and the conclusion where her words on Manet's fish, still life, act as a frame for the book. And she's talking here about, um, the, in particular, the Gurnard, the carp, and the eel, an image of which she may be showing you. I quote, by juxtaposing thrash, wiggle, and stillness, Manet upsets the very hope for stability, introduces disturbance into the pictorial field. Fish, still life, is by turns unnerving, chilling and alarmingly beautiful. A marvelous, touching, disgusting, pungent, tension-filled and perplexing painting that moves and intrigues us, not just visually, but also on a base humane level. Sorry, a base human level. In closing, Marnie leads us back to this painting in her conclusion to catch, and I quote, to catch Manet's point that even this, an agitated assortment of unready raw foodstuffs that could perhaps eventually be prepared and transformed into a meal may for now contain along with so much else, a timber of melancholy, a thrum of discomfort. And on that note, I'll turn you over to Marnie. Um, Janet, that was Really quite amazing. Thank you for those beautiful words. I'm, I'm truly moved. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you also for being such a wise and wonderful interlocutor. Um, I am greatly, um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk with you about the book. Thank you also, Rachel, Masha, and, Su and Susan for this opportunity, um, which uh, is really quite marvelous as books come out in the middle of a pandemic or hopefully at the end of a pandemic. Um, as our books come out, it, it's really uh, wonderful to have this opportunity to share things that might otherwise fall kind of <laughs> off to the side because we can't in any other way really actively celebrate them. So thank you very much and thank all of you um, for coming. This is very much an NCFS book. I've given papers related to some of the material that ultimately um, became the chapters of the book at many, probably far too many NCFSs. And I am so grateful for your many insightful comments and support of this project over the years. Um, so I will now turn to my prepared remarks. The premise of my book is this. Representations of food are profoundly evocative, conveying material and immaterial possibilities that may appear to be incongruent with their seemingly mundane subject matter. 
depictions of the elementary, I argue, resonate far beyond the physical bounds of the picture plane, tying us to both the sensory present and the fullness of the past, to our memories, our families, our traditions, our happinesses and our losses. And these pictures are, of course, fixed too to the artists who created them, to sentient beings who lived and ate. At the center of my study are works by Manet, Volon, Caillebotte, and Dugas that may superficially conjure narratives of gustatory pleasures. But as I show, they each engage more nuanced and even unsettling associations. These depictions of fish, fruit, butter, and meat, things so apparently anodyne, are, in my analysis, haunted by anxiety, nostalgia, and melancholy for and about family, home, and the past. Rooted in history, these images immerse us in the present, in the smell and taste and feel of what we see depicted, sometimes pale versions of the real thing, and sometimes so vivid that they catch our breath. My own visceral responses to these pictures, intertwined with a more academic approach to understanding their historical contexts, formed the very foundation of this project and helped me to begin to construe their seemingly contradictory effects. The works I focus on spool across a period of great social, cultural, and political turmoil, when the expansion of industry and the protracted instability associated with housemanization coincided with the painful experiences and aftermath of war and war-induced food shortages when decades of concern about rampant food adulteration reached a fevered pitch and a public hygiene movement brought new regulations to butchery practices and the production and preservation of milk derivatives. During these years, I argue, edible things, whether real or represented, could be especially freighted, sources of both comfort and discomfort. For depictions of what we eat, precisely because of what they picture, could effectively function for contemporaries as their inverse, as sites for the negotiation of disquiet and discontent. Inherently connected to daily life, ritual, and identity, and also to the more fulsome entity, personal memory, food came to function materially and metaphorically for certain artists as a potent vehicle for evoking a spectrum of pleasure and uneasiness associated with public and private life in late 19th century Paris. In attending to these nuances and to the production, processing, handling, and consumption of food itself at the time, and how these material realities might be articulated by works of art, I shift away from the prevailing tendency to categorize images like these as still lives, I look more toward analytic scrutiny of them as representations of food containing very real critical capacities and expressive force. To put it another way, in this project, I seek to augment our study of depictions of elementary things by demonstrating that they demand to be treated as such and that certain linear models and classifications fail to do justice to the ways in which such images are singularly suggestive and, engen and engender distinctly visceral reactions of the sort that we likely don't have in relation to a painting of say flowers or insects or books or shells. Depictions of food I thus show are deeply complex and personal for the artists then as for viewers now. They inevitably evoke not just some of the more fugitive aspects of everyday life, but also the intricate webs that constitute our memories and the myriad pleasures and discomforts that may accompany our thoughts of them. Portrayals of comestibles are always richly evocative, capable of conveying delight and the promise of culinary satisfaction, even as they sublimate their corollary by introducing the potentially disruptive and transgressive power of food into analysis of representations of it, I thus expose the messier aspects of these images that take as their subject something so fundamental to human experience. Each chapter of the book focuses on one or two works and engages my larger point about how such ostensibly straightforward pictures can be dense with unanticipated significance. 
And while Manet's fish still life may at first appear to depict the ingredients for a humble stew and a vessel in which to cook it. And in fact, that is what I thought uh, when I started, when I set out to do research on this painting. But as I quickly discovered, wafting around this fragile veneer of contentment that an imagined bowl of fish stew would proffer is a surprising unsettledness. The mouth of the bloated gray mullet is poignantly ajar and its frayed tail is suspended as if fixed in that moment when it pointlessly thrashed about to free itself from its captor. Errant smears of blood read like fingerprints upon the worn away iridescence of the mullet skin so near to where its lifeless heart would be. A heap of oysters quivers at the left, their liquor blooming unchecked across the cloth beneath them. A red grenard seems poised to attack, its bristly fin suggesting that it could still cut seamlessly through the dark reaches of the ocean. Its stunned, bulging and protruding, uh, bulging and protruding eye unnerving. And an eel is troublingly animated as it slithers across this filthy tablecloth, a piece of which is tucked beneath its tail. Bodily and visceral, the elements of this painting are barely held in check, and lifeless sea creatures seem to be in the process of struggling to survive, each thick with anxiety, haunted by a grief we will never know. By imagining the scene in the way that he does, Manet invokes the dark realities of these peacine beings, the mingled smells of rotting fish and brine, too, emanating somehow from oil pigment laid on canvas. Instead of the ingredients for a bouillabaisse, he conjures putrefaction and death, bringing us, as I contend, to the corpses on display in both the new Paris morgue and contemporary textual renditions of crime scenes. At first glance, Antoine Volon's magisterial mound of butter seems the very epitome of richness and comfort. Creamy cushions of buttercup yellow churn and were and are marshaled to constitute the very texture of butter. But what may initially seem so enticing, conjuring thoughts of lavish meals and complex sauces, flaky pastries and sugary confections, reveals a more unsettling possibility. This heap of butter is on the cusp of both, of both spoiling and melting, its battered and liquescent surface betraying that its very materiality is in peril. As I argue, it is just this, the real product's inherent ephemerality that led Vallon to turn to it for this painting in which he could model it into a cipher for expressing contemporary anxieties about butter's pervasive adulteration and concerns about its safe preservation. I further demonstrate how the milk product's intrinsic plasticity allowed the artist to evoke, too, a severed head, and thus France's traumatic memory of the guillotine and debates about its continued use throughout the 19th century. In Gustav Kaibut's fruit displayed on a stand, crumpled papers of uh, crumpled sheets of Papier Joseph disaggregate clusters of brilliantly colored fruits, the whole composition formally echoing the radiating grid of Haussmann's Paris and summoning the multicolored maps that themselves constructed an orderly version of the swiftly changing urban fabric. For these segments of fruit I, I show, scan like the cartographers in this case, pink, green, blue, and yellow arrondissement, each one ribboned with boulevards and veined by streets. In establishing these formal and metaphorical connections between plots of fruit and plots of land, both real and represented, Kaibat transmutes a picture of fruit into a new urban design. But even as he celebrates the new metropolis, this canvas, I argue, also seems to mourn the rural farmland, farmlands in which the fruits were grown and the old city that was lost when parts of it were demolished. In contrast to the other artists upon whom I focus in this book, Edgar Degas rarely included food in his work. But in two quite disparate images, we find, of all things, prominent pieces of vividly rendered meat. In his 1866 painting, a jarringly corporeal bloody pig's trotter is nestled against a boudin sausage on a platter that lies on a table 
beside an anonymous man and a raw rib roast sits on a woolen, wooden pallet on the floor at his right. These boldly realized cuts of flesh uncomfortably recalling the animal bodies in which they were originated and contemporary debates about public sanitation and butchery that led to the opening of La Villette, the centralized slaughterhouse on the northeastern edge of Paris a year later in 1867. In Dugas early canvas that so powerfully incorporates meat, we also discover a preview of his much later inclusion of his friend Manet's 1875 oil painting, Ham. In a photograph from 1895, the complicated narrative of which leads us to see how a cut wedge of cured porcine flesh might visually and conceptually restore the lost parts of a human body. Like the masses of meat in the 1866 painting, this representation of a cooked ham, which Dugas ensured would be showered in a dazzling beam of lamplight, amplifies the suggestive possibilities of the photograph. These eloquent ingredients that are central to both compositions far exceed their purely culinary value, invoking not just animal butchery, but also contemporary anatomical drawings of cross-section views of the interior of the human body. The fish, butter, fruits, and meats depicted by Manet, Volon, Dugas, and Caibat hold unexpected and untold possibility. What I offer in discomfort food are readings that are formed by close looking, deep archival research and engagement with the secondary literature. If the methods and theories of academic practice establish the armature of this study, my own history lies at the book's beating heart. To be sure, images of culinary things like their analogs in our world are distinctly freighted and personal for the artist then as for the viewer now. Their sensory and conceptual dimension seemingly endless in ways both concrete and ineffable. Many factors, some conscious, some not, brought me to this mound of butter, this arrangement of fruit, this tablescape of fish, this man who is surrounded by cuts of meat, this photograph that features a painting of a sliced ham, though others would surely have provided equally fertile ground for analysis. But something of these works independently and collectively made sense to me as the foundation for this book that explores the expansive resonances of representations of food, how they may evoke the promise of great pleasure and comfort, even as they embody and spark countervailing arcs of discomfort. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you. Um, can, we, can we start by going right to the heart of the discomfort. <laughs> um, so the book, as you, as you tell it in this panoramic view, is focused on representations of food that are disquieting, melancholic, even anxiogenic. Though you certainly do discuss the pleasures and comforts of gastronomy in their 19th century history. And we certainly know from many 19th century French studies restaurant meals that you personally appreciate these. <laughs> gastronomy is not your focus. And I wonder if you could elaborate on the draw of culinary discomfort. That is, what is it that we find so fascinating about disgusting or discomforting food? What pulled you away from the splendors of gastronomy to the miseries of its underside? I mean, that really does get at the heart of this project with which began um, when with Masha Balenki, I was in the National Gallery of Art. This had to have been 15 years ago. And we happened upon Volon's Mound of Butter. And I remember saying to Masha, I must find a way to write about this painting. I was enthralled as many people are. It is truly a remarkable painting and it's quite small. Um, it was what was, uh, it was in what used to be called the small paintings gallery. Um, and it, it's quite small, but it is one of the most magnificent things I think I've ever seen. And I was absolutely taken by it. But what I was also taken by, in addition to the elegance of the of the brushwork the, the the facture that so convincingly rendered the texture of butter 
But I also saw something stirring beneath that. There was something about this picture that troubled me. Um, and I, I immediately um, connected it in my head to a painting of a uh, of a severed head <laughs> um, that was at that point thought to be by uh, Jericho. Uh, we now know that it was by one of his colleagues and that it actually pictures Jericho's head on his deathbed. Um, but the point is, I, I was able to see the, the, the two, the superficial, not so superficial gorgeousness of this picture at the same time that what drew me also further into it was this underside that I had no idea would take me in the places I went. And I, I had no idea that butter was such a fraught substance at this time that it was one of the most highly adulterated substances. And, and this was you know, a real problem for contemporaries. So what initially pulled me was the, the gorgeousness of it, but also what kept me there was something that I saw stirring beneath it. And I would say that the pretty much something like that happened in relation to all the other images that I focus on, the Manet, for example, I wanted more than anything to write about that lemon. That is like the butter, I must say, a, such a spectacular lemon. Um, you know, it's like the color of the sun. It is just the most beautifully painted thing. But the eel so disgusted me. And I remember talking with a, a, another friend um, and saying, I, I want to write about this, but that eel, I, I just can't. And she said, you have to confront the eel. And I think that there's something really important in that lesson. And as I worked on this book and as I worked on that painting, I came to realize, and I do write about this in the, um, in the chapter, how that eel in every way brought me back to my childhood fishing in the Catskill Mountains with my grandfather and my father and my uncle and my cousin and my sister and how all of them were able to put the worm on their hooks, but I simply couldn't. That worm was far too grotesque to me the, and it was the way it moved. And there was something in that, in that eel. Now, of course, you know, that might sound like the mo most ridiculous thing, but it's what I, I came to realize one of the aspects of this painting that made me want to write about it. And similarly, that mullet, something about it seems so melancholy to me. And I know that's not a prevailing feeling about it, um, but it seems so melancholy. And it suddenly I realized it took me, and again, you know, these are very um, objective, excuse me, subjective responses, but I hope I'm demonstrating how that is a, an important element of my analysis. But I couldn't help but think about a photograph that sat on my grandmother's dresser all the years I ever knew her, of my grandfather holding a fish, a huge fish that he had caught. And just something of that mullet took me there. So it's it's the it's that conjunction of the sheer beauty but also the pathos of these images and i also will say that there's so much meaning in that contradiction that seeming contradiction i don't think it's really contradictory at all i think they're all part of the same coin you know the the absolute beauty and the disgust that come come into play in all of these images and there's the, the that that tension between revulsion and attraction for me at least um, brought great richness of meaning and helped me I think to do something with these images that took me in directions I, I you know I didn't envision going in and I think we all, you know, are fascinated by things that both repulse and and attract us. You know, th that is a fundamental thing that we all share as human beings. Um, I just, you know, harnessed it <laughs> for my project, though I don't think I realized I was doing it all along. It something that hit me as the parts of it came together. Thank you so much. To um to shift substances for a moment away from the mushy and the slithery, um, <laughs> can we talk about fruit now? Um, I, you mentioned the crumpled sheets of Papier Joseph, the tissue-like paper that separates and frames the fruit varieties in Caillebotte's uh, fruit displayed on a stand. Uh, in that chapter, 
you follow the trail of this paper before and beyond the painting. Could you say a little bit more about what your research uncovered about this paper? I know people will need to, to read the book to get the full narrative, but the, 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 the footsteps, the journey is so vast that it might be interesting if you could talk about your research and how it changed the course of the chapter. Yeah, in, in that particular case, I had no idea, you know, I, I knew and there are some scholars, including a few who are here, I know today, who've written very beautifully about that painting. Um, and, uh, you know, we all, I think, are very aware of the way in which what what I discovered is Papier Joseph. Actually, I did not know that when I began the research, but that the paper that we see both framing individual plots of fruit and also around individual fruits themselves and how the juxtaposition of that sort of silvery, the way, you know, Kaibut renders a kind of silvery white paper, how that creates a gorgeousness of effect. I mean, it just really makes the colors stand out. But as I started to do my research, I discovered that that's actually the packing material. And that some, this thing called Papier Joseph, which, um, which is sort of like what we might call tissue paper today, um, that the Papier Joseph uh, is actually, you know, realizing that it's actually packing material took me back to those farms, you know, and to this notion that the wrinkles that we see, yes, they're probably, you know, manipulated by the greengrocer who turns this into, you know, a spectacular display. And then, of course, Kaibut, the artist, who then does what he does with it. Um, but it's connected to those hands, to those laborers. And in finding out this information about that Papier Joseph, I discovered a whole other dimension about this painting um, that I always saw. And again, this is you know, something I try to argue and I hope I argue convincingly. It always made me think about those colored maps of Paris in the late 19th century. I mean, into the 20th, of course. But you know, those plots of fruit looking like the arrondissement in, the co in those colored maps. So I always sort of felt that and I knew that was part of what I was going to argue. But then realizing this connection to the farmland um, also was, was a, took me in direction directions and expanded the temporal possibilities of this painting really greatly for me. Um, and, and it's those kinds of joyous moments, and we all have them as scholars, when we discover these things that we didn't have any idea were out there. Um, and honestly, you know, I often wonder, had my, had my research for any of these chapters gone in, you know, different directions, Actions, what a different book this would be. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the most important takeaways. You know, this is just one possibility. Um, uh, what, we, what we all do, we work on, you know, visual representation or textual representation. Um, and, you know, the representation is, is infinitely interpretable. Of course, we use, you know, our knowledge and the research that we do to try to build convincing arguments. Um, and so the, the things I discovered you know, really um, became the, the kind of lens and the substance of these chapters, but they were things I didn't realize I would discover, those unanticipated moments, those amazing moments um, that, that changed the course of everything. And it happened in each case, actually, in every single chapter for me. Thank you. Like, for example, the Manet painting that I truly thought, oh, these are the ingredients for a fish stew of some sort. Um, and then I, you know, went through all kinds of late 19th century French um, recipe books, and I could not find a recipe that combined these kinds of ingredients. Um, and not only that, most fish stews call for orange and orange zest, not lemon. Um, but Manet needed the lemon, the color of that lemon, and it's, you know, it needed to be in this painting. And so I quickly realized that this really has nothing to do with the preparation of a meal, um, even though it superficially may seem to and may be part of what drew me to it. Thank you so much. You uncover a very long winding story, um, spiraling story in your Degas chapter. 
Uh, you tell the story of Degas' painting of Edouard and Suzanne Manet and of Suzanne being lopped off by her husband, no less, because he disliked Degas' representation of his wife. And you talk about Degas intending to repaint her, but he never did. He never got around to it. And instead, you argue, he replaced her by, or displaced her to, Manet's own painting of a ham. And people, you'll have to read the book to get the full story because <laughs> it's even more complicated. But for now, I wonder, Marnie, if you could in some small way put poor Madame Manet back into the picture, so to speak. I mean, I'm not asking you to do a biography like the one of Zelda Fitzgerald or Alma Mahler, um, but can you tell us anything more about poor Suzanne Manet? who was just chopped out of the picture? <laughs> yes. Suzanne Manet uh, uh, was initially hired by Manet's father to teach his sons to play piano. And um, there's a lot of sort of interesting intrigue. She, she uh, bears a child out of wedlock um, <laughs> a few years after, and there's a lot of speculation about who the father of this boy Leon Lehnhoff is, um, and uh, some argue it's Manet himself, some argue it's Manet Père, you know, and it, certainly there is no, we will probably never know, but the point here is that she's initially hired, she's Dutch by birth, and she is hired to teach uh, the family to play piano, um, and then ultimately Manet and she will have an affair, and then they will ultimately marry after the father dies, um, and they will marry in 1863, and um, she was a really gifted pianist and um, her, the family salons were incredibly popular because in part of her incredible um, musicality and the beautiful music that she played at the salons. Um, and so it's, it, I think it's, it's sad, very sad, you know, that we lose that of her because of course that's part of what's lopped away um, in, in, the, in the picture that, um, in the portrait that Dugas made of um, the, the Manets. Uh, when Manet slices through, he cuts off the front of his wife's body and probably the piano that she was playing. Of course, he will then later, uh, a, a few years later, create his own retort and uh, to that, um, to that painting uh, and to the um, way he felt about how Dugas represented his wife. But, you know, Baudelaire writes about how beautiful and kind she was. Um, and others do too. Giuseppe de Nittis, who was an Italian artist who spent a great deal of his career in Paris and was friends with this group of artists, also talked greatly or wrote great, you know, wrote, wrote a lot about how kind and dear and wonderful she was. Um, and so the things we know about her come from Manet's own portraits of her. He painted her, interestingly, not as often as he painted Victorine Miron, for example, or Bert Morisot. Um, he painted Madame Manet only about six times. He represents her in other media, in different, in other, in, you know, in other media, but he paints um, Bert Morisot 11 times in a very short period of time. But during their 20 year marriage from 1863 until Manet's death in 1883, he only paints Suzanne six times, which is kind of interesting because you'd think that she would be one of the most available models for him. Maybe, so, he's, just, yeah. maybe he's just really critical, uh, really apprehensive about the way she will appear in paint, even if he's the artist. You know, these are things, of course, we'll never know. And yeah. these are just interesting tidbits. Um, and I, I don't know that we can really replace her right. in, in, into, this, into this work. And um, uh, shout out to Mike Garval, who um, in his research on postcards featuring pigs um, and uh, pigs and humans and how pigs uh, during the late 19th century and early 20th century come to become substitutes for human beings, you know, I'm able to weave this larger story about that, that uh, Manet's slice of ham, which also I argue, um, relates to contemporary anatomical drawings that artists would have studied um, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. They studied with um, physicians. Physicians taught the um, 
an internal anatomy to artists so that they knew how to lay the skin and knew how to envision the exterior of the body, but they learned how to rep they learned about representations of the insides of the body. And so I argue that that ham really does conjure the insides of a body and the combination of it being a pork product, you know, something from a pig um, and, and it's sort of anatomical, um, the formal relationship between it and anatomical drawings, in some way that and the placement of it within the syntax of the photograph lead us to see how Degas was gonna have the last laugh in this photograph. And he was going to find a way to, whether he's replacing Suzanne's body, which I think in part he is, but he's also putting his voice back into a situation that troubled him greatly. He was furious with Manet when he um, lopped off Madame Manet from the painting. And when he, he saw it, Degas saw it when he visited with the Manets. And he was so furious that, you know, he took it. He took it back with the plan, as you said, to uh, repaint her and he never does. Um, and he even um, wrote a note to Manet and said, I'm sending you back your plums because you know I'm just furious with you. So he sent back a small still life of plums that, that Manet had given to him in exchange possibly for the portrait that Degas had made. And so the story is really quite wonderful and has many nuances and trajectories that relate to this photograph. It's, yeah, it's quite convoluted. Um, I want to ask you one last question to kind of pull back from particulars. And uh, I don't know, I think it's something that is of interest to all of us as writers and researchers. Um, back to fruit. Um, you open the book with Virginia Woolf's musing on Cezanne's painting of seven apples, uh, strangely misremembered by Woolf as six apples. Um, so Virginia Woolf asked, what can six apples not be? And you remark, well, there are plenty of things they cannot be. But in the process, you recognize the infinite potential of a scatter of apples. So you're suggesting there a tension between what we might call interpretation, terminable and interminable. Um, you know, attention, uh, sorry, attention between terminable interpretation and interminable interpretation. And you come back to this towards the end. Food is infinitely interpretable, always laden with meanings, you say. But at a certain point, the game stops. There are plenty of things it cannot be. And this tension strikes me as relevant to the whole book. That is, you take us on a series of adventures uh, from the history of art, to the lives and rivalries of the artists, to their literary colleagues, to pan-aesthetic pan insights, to mapping, to gardening advice, to market layouts, interspersed with visits to the morgue, with detours to slaughterhouses, balloon views of Paris, whodunit plots, artists' um, uh, savageness toward each other, not to mention several recipes. So just when the reader's head is starting to reel in any given chapter at the number of places we've seen, you snap us back. You snap us back in place. And we understand why we made this journey. I know, I think most of us know from experience that sometimes it's really hard when writing a book to know how far to go and to know when to stop. And I'm wondering, if this was your experience and tell us, how did you confront it? How does a researcher, how does an author know when to stop? This is of course facing right now. So yeah, it's the eternal life. question for all of us, isn't it? You know, I, my hope is I stopped at the right point <laughs> and that, you know, what I weave the various scenarios and stories and contexts that I weave, I hope are compelling and convincing. I really do believe fundamentally the image, it, I always start with the image, the image is where I start. And so I feel confident that if what I see 
is then borne out or, it, you know, by my research, or if my research reveals something and I see it in the painting, that's how I know. Um, it, you know, it's, it's always that object for me and also my own personal response to it. And in this case, you know, that was, that was an important element of the whole project. So I think, you know, it's hard to know when to stop. And I can only hope that I, I knew when to, when to say, okay, this is over. <laughs> you know, um, I was pretty excited about the things I discovered. And, you know, there are plenty of things though that sit in files that I didn't use. So I think one's always making choices and I did make choices as we all do. Yeah, yeah, but it always comes together. That's the kind of amazing thing. It always comes Thank together. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so I think it's time for us all to come together and for me to turn the questions over to the audience. Um, there's a question from Corey Cropper. Um, Marnie, you speak of disgust and the queasiness of flesh being connected to a living animal. Is that an American thing? Or is there evidence of the same squeamishness existing in 19th century France? That is an excellent question, Corey. I think that that is an American thing. It is my thing, my squeamishness. In the 19th century, the concern was more for, you know, public hygiene and the fear that people might see the slaughtering of an animal, you know, in, a, in an alleyway or um, somewhere where they shouldn't be seeing it, which of course is what will ultimate part of what will lead to the creation of La Villette in 1867. But yeah, that, that, that squeamishness, I think, is um, mine. <laughs> um, but, but I think it is also there in the picture, in the, in these, in the pictures where I talk about it. Um, and I guess that mostly comes into play in the Manet work, um, in the Manet painting, and that the, the eel, eels are not you know, eels are very popular in France. People eat eels. I mean, still, I mean, it, eel is, is a delicacy. It's a delicious thing. But as I describe, it's my personal response to that eel that kind of led me to see it in this painting and ultimately to, to see also that it, you know, Manet achieves um, this sense of it moving, slithering into this picture. Um, and that that is, there's something about the juxtaposition of that with the other creatures, that is very disturbing. Hope that answers Corey's question. Uh, Thanks, no. Corey. Is Corey here? He, he did a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, okay, good, good, good. Um, and if that wasn't enough, we have another question about um, repulsion and disgust from Ruth Cruikshank, who asks, uh, Oh, it's a bit long. I hope you don't mind uh, a 20th, 21st century interloper, not at all. Um, she says, I worked on representations of food um, uh, and have just published a book uh, called Leftovers. Among the leftovers I mobilize are lack via Lacan, an objection via Chris Deva, and the fascination slash repulsion tension you speak of. Um, and um, ambivalences of desire uh, that fuel representational practice as it intersects leftovers of genre. So embracing your generous one possibility idea, as I saw your images and heard you speak and discuss the book, I wondered about the libidinal aspects that evoke that desire discussed ambivalence that might be read in the painting, Eels and Oyster, and how it might <clears throat> excuse me, how it might speak of late 19th century sexuality, figs, pears, less ambivalently, too. And I think there's <laughs> certainly a case to be made for a reading that's more focused on the psychoanalytic, the, um, the libidinal. I think that's, you know, absolutely a possibility. It's not where I went. Um, though the psychoanalytic is certainly there for me um, as, as a thinker, as someone, you know, who um, is aware of how, you know, images are representations <laughs> and not givens, you know, that we, that they're deeply, in, that, you know, we're deeply invested as lookers, as we're artists, as, as the creators. 
Um, I, I would just say that that would be a really interesting and fruitful um, avenue of exploration, um, though it wasn't mine. And I guess this goes back to Janet's question about where do you stop, you know? For me, as some, I'm, I'm very interested in historical context, and so that was really important for me. And had my research revealed, um, and it may have if I had done a different kind of research, but had my research revealed these kinds of connections, and certainly fruits, yes, that does, fruits do have very, um, and at the time had very clear connections, especially to the female body. Um, that is in the literature, and that certainly I came across a lot. But um, I didn't really necessarily see that at work in Kaibut's painting, but you know, it might be something very relevant in another work from this period that I didn't write about. Thank you, Marnie. Following uh, the historical thread, there's a question from Maury Samuels, um, who says, I'm curious whether you're arguing there is something distinct to the 19th century about this way of painting food. Is there a difference from, say, Chardin? Are Manet and company more discomforting? I don't necessarily think so. Um, and that's, again, a great question. Thank you, Maury. Um, you know, Manet was very indebted to Chardin. I mean, he, he really, you know, there's, there's a lot of scholarship that explores the very real formal connections and the ways in which he, like his contemporaries, engaged with, with um, Chardin's work, which, you know, really had a kind of revival um, with a, an exhibition in 1860 at the Galerie Martinet, and people saw his work, um, and still life became much more popular. I would say, however, that the historical resonances that I see, and certainly, you know, in the case of the Manet, again, the connection to the morgue um, and the way in which that tablecloth looks like the marble slabs that the bodies were propped up on in the morgue, you know, those are things that are very specific to the late 19th century, um, at least in my readings of them. But I absolutely believe, and I hope I um, am convinced I'm convincing and can convey how I do believe that images of food should be thought about as such because there's so much that's meaningful about food, whether it's the 18th century or the 19th century. My story is very rooted in the 19th century, of course, the late 19th century. Um, but of course, and I don't know, I may, you know, I, I'm very interested in Sheldon and I may work a little bit on him in the future. And I'm, I'm sure and I'm excited to see, you know, where that takes me. I do think food is very, it is evocative in ways that other still life elements aren't. And that the, these kinds of images really do deserve a kind of analysis that explores that kind of fullness um, of such imagery. Thank you, Marnie. Uh, perhaps one final question um, from, I'm, I apologize, I don't know if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, Christine Tonte or Christine Tomte? Christine Tomte, <laughs> um, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, you talked about the tension between repulsion and attraction, the conjunction of sheer beauty and the seemingly the seeming contradiction of these images. Can we infer here that food as seen in these images and paintings is an expression of a sort of malaise culinaire or can we draw parallels between this sort of malaise with the 19th century mal du siècle? I um, okay, I think that, you know, uh, food, um, really, since from the 18th century, um, you know, the kind of codification of gastronomy and food and recipe books and all of the things that, you know, the late great Priscilla Parkhurst Ferguson, um, among many others, taught us about um, the ways in which gastronomy were, was um, configured and became a thing and how food and cuisine became such a French thing. Um, I do think that it's because food at the time was so inherently meaningful to this culture. And I'll just you know, say again that the, the larger concerns about 
food adulteration at the time were great. And, you know, concerns about, you know, eating or drinking something and dying from it. People really did have those concerns. And so I think that there's more of a connection to the very real historical, those historical realities for me um, in my analysis of these, of these pictures. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, and apologies to everyone whose questions we didn't get to. I was trying to have questions that went in different directions. Um, but read the book and then you'll have lots more questions. Uh, thank you, Marnie. Um, thank you for writing this absolutely fabulous book. And I guess we will close down the official part, but people are welcome to hang around and drink their beverage of choice. <laughs> and turn their video on. Right, exactly. Thank you, thank you, Janet. Thank you for, for this incredible conversation. And thank you for being an earlier, an early supporter of this book. It means a great deal to me. Thank you, and all of you. And thank you, Janet and Marnie for this fantastic, such a stimulating conversation that made me hungry, it made me <laughs> a little squeamish, uh, but um, it was really, really fantastic. Thank you both so much. And congratulations, Marnie, on a really stellar, amazing book. I, I feel very honored that I was there with you at the very, at the very beginning at the, where they sure. were planted. <laughs> when I was been there all along when you were staring at this uh, beautiful picture of butter and I was thinking to myself, hmm, butter? Um, and <laughs> here we are. <laughs> what, you, what you made with this butter is really an amazing, an amazing cake, if I can allow myself. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, thank uh, you. Metaphor, so thank you so much. Thank you. Time.